I'm Eric. Uh, I don't have a bio slide, but it's easy to find information about me. Um, this last presentation of the day is going to be a little different. Um, this is uh, Dev++, but um, my opinion, the first thing that developers need to know is what they're building. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, theory behind Bitcoin. And uh, I'm going to introduce a new term that I just cooked up because there wasn't a term that made me happy. So uh, I'm going to define something called crypto dynamics by the end of this, which I consider a subset of crypto economics. Um, and here we are. So what's crypto? Um, I just pulled this out of Wikipedia, chopped it up a little bit. Cryptocurrency is a money that uses strong cryptography to secure financial transactions, control the creation of additional units, and verify the transfer of units. And those, I thought that was actually, a, aside from the fact that it uses cryptography to secure the stuff, the other parts I thought were, were pretty spot on. Those two things are important and we'll come back to that. And we'll come back to why cryptography is not the source of security. Okay, uh, dynamics. So again, from Wikipedia, dynamics is a branch of applied mathematics concerned with the study of forces and their effect on motion. So things actually happening, moving. Um, and this is important when it comes to defining what Bitcoin is and how it's secured. Okay, so we put those together. You know, again, I just cooked this up because I didn't have the right word for it. Uh, forces that generally, again, this is paraphrasing the, the previous slide, basically uh, previous to forces that generally secure financial transactions. And specifically, by doing that by def controlling the definition of units, in other words, controlling the definition of the money, you know, can, can somebody just cook up some more? And controlling the transfer of units, in other words, uh, you know, who gets, basically who gets mined, right? Who, what, what, what transactions can get confirmed? Okay, so to do that, I'm gonna go through, um, so I've talked that I give quite a bit, I'm um, gonna try to st stay on time, but this is um, a good amount of material. And um, I'm gonna speak quickly, because I always do. But um, I do have a lot more text on some of the later slides than I normally would, because I wanted um, you know, non-native English speakers to get the benefit of the translations and have some content with them. So uh, I'll try not to just read those, but there's some, uh, there's some good text for the takeaway. So what is Bitcoin? Conceptually, what are we dealing with? Um, so I, and these are my definitions. Sometimes they're a little bit different than what you might be used to, but this is really just for the sake of this discussion. You don't have to take it away if you don't want to. But I consider Bitcoin a class of cryptocurrencies, given the previous definitions of those. And Bitcoin is a, is a transaction confirmation market, okay? You have miners and merchants. Merchants are people who sell stuff to other people for Bitcoin, in my definition, okay? Doesn't mean they're selling dollars or shoes or gas or drugs or, you know, gambling or whatever, they're merchants. Um, they're the ones who validate the coin they receive in a way that actually matters. Miners are the ones that sell confirmations, right? They get paid fees for confirming transactions. The merchants pay them for it. So if you think about the direct analogy in the Visa network, right? Visa's uh, the miners, they sell confirmations, the merchants are the ones that want the transactions confirmed. And you might think as technical people, well, it's really the, the people who buy the stuff that send the transactions off to get confirmed. So I ask you, if you, if you submit a Visa, if you go and you know, make a Visa charge at the gas station or something, do you care if it gets confirmed? No, you don't want it to be confirmed, right? The, the gas station guy wants it to be confirmed. The merchant is the only one who cares. So don't, don't be confused by the technical flow of things. Think about the conceptual model, right? This is, what, this is what Bitcoin is. It's a market for confirming transactions. And for some reason, it has better characteristics in some, in some ways than other markets for confirming transactions, right? Okay, and, and uh, so this class of cryptocurrencies shares a common security model, again, by my definition of what we're talking about in terms of Bitcoin. Um, so I would consider Litecoin a Bitcoin, right? It's got some minor parameter changes, a few tweaks here and there, but it's, it follows, there's nothing in the white paper that doesn't describe Litecoin. So that, that's, that's what I'm talking about here, okay? Not, not BTC specifically. And those concepts are defined by the white paper even if they're not so clearly spelled out. And so that's what I'm gonna try to do is help more clearly spell them out so that when we're looking at um, whether something is a Bitcoin or not, you know, conceptually, does it follow that model? How do we know? And where, where, what are the limits? What really matters? Is the block size the thing that matters? Is it the every specific rule? Uh, you know, what, what actually is securing the money to the extent that it matters? And so we're going to talk about the dynamic principles and the things that are actually securing the money. Okay, and that's that. So why is it a better money than other monies? 
Some cases it's clearly not. If you don't have a network, it's not a very good money. Um, but in some cases, it's, it's, it's got significant value. So the value proposition of Bitcoin is that it gets the state out of the money as much as possible, right? All the costs that go into other monies that Bitcoin eliminates are all the result of being free from state control, okay? Nation states, governments, what have you. So um, I just call this the money tax, right? There's direct taxation that comes out of being able to control and see the flow of money. There's monetary inflation, which we shall all be familiar with. There's foreign exchange controls, regulatory controls, and surveillance, which again comes back to being able to enforce taxes, ultimately. So these are all costs of using monies that Bitcoin tries to reduce. It can't eliminate the state, tax, or banking, but it makes the money better by getting the state out of it as much as possible. You know, in the end, that may result in more transparent taxation. People may be able to see how they're being taxed, but that's not really the important aspect. We're just analyzing what makes it valuable. So the state, uh, you know, in our, in our technical terminology, the state attacks every market. Every market is under the attack by the state. It's a third party uh, injecting itself between other two parties to tax. So through control, extract tax from the market, where the market here is the, is the, other, the previous slide, right? The transaction confirmation market. Try not to spill that on your laptop there. Okay, so we have the definition of what we're talking about in terms of Bitcoin, the reason it's valuable, and then we can talk about, well, how does the secure, how does it actually secure itself? Well, I usually have a longer talk on this, but I'm just gonna go through what I consider the four phases of Bitcoin to kind of give you a sense of the security model. These are not necessary phases. It does not ever have to go out of the honeymoon phase, which it is in right now. But these are the phases that the security model anticipates. Right? It's, it's why things work the way they work. Bitcoin anticipates that some person with some power might want to actually make it illegal. So then it can still operate, right? We, we think it can still it can withstand that. And then we also think that somebody might try to 51% attack, right? They might try to control transaction flow. And, and we have to ask ourselves, well, how do we defend against that? How does the system do that? But those are the things it's designed to do. So quickly, four phases, honeymoon phase, it's not having enough of an impact on taxation for the state to care. And I'm, I'll talk more about the generalization of the state later because it's always a question. But they don't care. So, yeah, there's regulatory controls that apply to all financial stuff that kind of apply to Bitcoin, but it's not under attack by the state. It, not really anywhere. So we're in the sunny moon phase where we can do what we want and it all looks secure until, you know, until it doesn't. So when the state realizes, hey, this thing actually works, it's actually taking tax revenue you know, out from the state. We, we don't want that. We don't want to lose... Transact the ability to tax what we can see you know, outside of the money. We don't want to lose what we call um, monetary policy, the ability to create new money, spend it ourselves, right? Don't want to lose that. Well, what's the easiest thing to do when you're the state? Pass a law, right? Now, some people will say, well, you know, laws are hard to pass because voters will reject that. Well, I say that's the status quo. That's where we are already without Bitcoin, right? Voters already have the power. You know, the pitchforks, whatever they need to go and make a good money or to prevent the state from messing with their gold, whatever. The theory is that doesn't work, okay? So, so we have to be able to do that without permission. Bitcoin doesn't require permission. So state steps in and says, oh, it's, it's now illegal. You can't, you can't use it. And, then I'll, and I'll show you what the alternative will be that they'll propose, but that's the easiest thing. Stroke of a pen, boom, it's illegal. Now, what, what happens? Everybody that's using Bitcoin, meaning mining and merchanting, is a money launderer. A criminal, money launder, right? Everything to do with Bitcoin all of a sudden became black market. That could happen with a stroke of a few pens around the world. Doesn't have to happen everywhere. That's not really the important thing. So we go into this black market phase, but guess what? Just like all black markets, it just continues to do its thing just in you know, different places. So about a third of the world's economy is, is black market. And Bitcoin can you know, presumably serve a good part of that. Um, and maybe it stays there forever, right? People just keep using it and you know, state says it's illegal, but it's just kind of like, you know, gambling in some parts of the world, prostitution, drugs, you know, labor, whatever. But if it's really still making an impact and they want to stomp this thing out, it's the drug war, right? We're going we're to really, you know, send in the Blackhawks and clean out uh, Columbia or something. What do they do? Well, they pull up one of these videos and they go, what should we do? We should compete. We should compete with the miners. Because by competing with the miners, they can get control of transaction ordering, which means, or not, not just ordering, but confirmation, which means you can reject transactions, you can censor, 
but you can also require identity to get confirmed, which means you can get all the information you got from the legacy financial system. So competition is the 51% attack where the state just throws a bunch of hash power at the system and, and tries to uh, control transaction ordering. Again, some people say that's not possible. I think that's nonsense, and we'll talk about why here in a second. Um, okay, so let's, let's say the state's winning this 51% attack, and just nobody, you know, the market can't overpower it. What happens? Surrender. The market gives up. There's no more Bitcoin, basically, right? Or state's losing, market, market's winning. What happens? State probably has to give up at some point. No. So I'll explain why. Um, what, what's paying for the censorship? So, like if st state steps in and wants to 51% attack, they stop taking certain transactions, the ones they don't want, right? The ones that aren't maybe signed by the state. So what happens to those transactions? What happens if you put a transaction into the network and it doesn't get confirmed? You either give up or you raise your fee, right? You raise your fee, you raise your fee, you raise your fee. State's not taking those fees. But the fees are rising for other miners who will take them. So once they rise high enough, more hash power comes online. State now is competing with higher hash rate. It has to raise its hash rate without getting the additional fees. Okay, there's a delta there between the fees the state's taking and the fees the black market miners are taking. Call that a fee premium. And that fee premium is what's securing Bitcoin against censorship. If people are willing to pay enough, the black market will come on, the free market miners will come on and mine those transactions. The state, in order to counter that, will have to raise taxes, an external source of revenue to subsidize its mining, which is operating now at a loss. It can do that. How much? Who knows? Nobody, these aren't predictable things. Like, you know, what is, what is the cost of censoring Bitcoin? It's not a knowable thing. It has to do with how willing the state is to do it and how willing the market is to get transactions confirmed. Okay, doesn't have anything to do with total hash rate, <laughs> right? Think about those. So this is why it's important for developers to think about the security model because it's not what you think. All right. So I said I said earlier, you know, Fed to step in. I just I call this Fed coin. It's this abstraction that the perfect small smallest perfect minor modifications to Bitcoin to make it a government friendly currency, right? So what do you need? Those two things on the very first slides we were talking about that, 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 that the cryptocurrencies are doing, they're securing definition of the money and transaction confirmation, right? Select you know, ordering or, or um, uh, the ability to transact, right? So <laughs> those are the two things, obviously, that the state wants control of. They want monetary policy, and they want to be able to um, uh, have visibility or approval authority over all transactions. So how would they do that? Simple, simplest model is I, I step in, I say, okay, if you, if you mine any transaction, it has to be signed by the Fed or you know, some international body. So if it is, it's good, white market transaction. If it's not, it's money laundering. Okay, so now I have, I have pushed Bitcoin transaction ordering into the black market while giving an alternative, which seems perfectly safe and reasonable to everybody. So some people go one way, some people say, no, I'm gonna keep mining the black market transaction. The other thing they want is to be able to create new money, right? Obviously, that's what we're trying to stop. So how do they do that? Well, they force every merchant to accept a new rule which says if it's signed by me, the Fed or whatever, then it can be new money. You just issue new money, you know, an inflation bug, right? So with those two changes, it becomes the perfect money. So the merchants are defending against the definition of the money. They're the only ones that can validate in a way that matters. They can reject selling something to somebody if the money doesn't meet their criteria. That's economic force. Miners are the only ones that can control, control transaction ordering, therefore censorship. And um, the way that's going to be secured, as I described before, is by the black market stepping in and saying, I'm just going to mine them, right? So you have these two sides of the market, merchants and miners, which, like in every other market, are independently securing their own stuff. Right? If you go to Starbucks, they secure the store, the coffee, the registers, all that stuff. That's not your problem. You show up with some money, and you secure your, you secure your money. Right? That's not their problem. And then you trade. And that trade is mutually beneficial. Trade's a positive sum game. Both parties are better off after the trade, because otherwise they wouldn't have done it. Right? They wanted to. It's voluntary, so it's, by definition, better than what came before. So this free market you know, is now being attacked by the tax man who steps in and wants to do this stuff. So that, that's exactly how Bitcoin works. In other words, the threat model is not the miners and the merchants attacking each other. That's a nonsensical proposition. When anybody says, well, yeah, that can't happen in Bitcoin because they'd be destroying their own market and there'd be no incentive. Exactly. That's not the threat. right? It's, it's not why it's secure. It's just not the threat. The threat is the state. OK, so did I cover all this? Um, 
Yeah. Okay, so here we get to the, the thing I think is not really new, but more clearly defined. And when I say not really new, it's not new to me because these are things I've talked about and written about before in different ways, but probably new to most people in the room because, I don't know, I think differently. Um, okay, so the principles of cryptodynamics that I put down I call risk sharing, energy sinking, and power regulating. This is the stuff, this is the cool part. Okay, so security is by, de by its very nature a human problem. It's not a machine problem. So think about anything you might want to secure. Your house. Okay, so is your house secure because you lock the doors? Because you have a dog? Nope. <laughs> Smash the windows, go in, take all your stuff. No problem. Shoot the dog, give him some meat, whatever. It's not securing your house. What's securing your house is your neighbors or yourself when you're in the house. If you don't have any neighbors, imagine what your house is going to look like when you come back from vacation, right? Maybe not in Japan, but in the rest of the world. So it's people that provide security. So people say, well, guns. Guns will provide security. No, you know, guns just laid on the ground. They don't do anything. You've got to pick them up and aim them at somebody and, and use them, take a risk. So all forms of security, firewall. i got a firewall in the, wherever, back here somewhere. How does that, you know, how is that a human thing? Because... Without humans, somebody just walk in and unplug it, right? It's, everything is secured by people. So Bitcoin is no different, and I really want to emphasize that. Technology people, which I'm one of, you know, I have a long background in technology, but I'm also a security person, you know, an economics person, all other things, tend to forget this, like, or never knew it. Like, security does not come from cryptography. Cryptography is a tool, like a gun, that has to be used. So in Bitcoin, who's providing that security? Okay. Okay, people must act. So this action that I'm talking about is why I call it dynamic. People actually have to do things, right? It's not like dynamic math or crypto. It's people moving. Okay, so we only expect people to act in an economically rational manner, self-interest. If we don't, then we have a failed system, at least from an economic standpoint. Okay, so these are the forces that secure Bitcoin. I'm going to talk about each of these. These are the ones that have more words on the slides. Okay, so three principles, and then a summary slide, and then I'll be done. I'm not even keeping track of time, so tell me where I am. Okay, the risk-sharing principle. I have, these are all topics that are in the Bitcoin base library repo um, under a, basically a book called Crypto Economics. Risk-sharing principle is one of these principles. So Bitcoin requires people to merchant and mine despite it being illegal. If they don't do that, it just doesn't exist, right? Imagine... Step in, sign a law, it's illegal, boom. Everybody says, oh, pff, it's illegal, I'm not doing it anymore. It's done, there's no more Bitcoin. So the assumption is people will actually go and break the law or there's no, there's no security, there's nothing, right? It's all gone. So you can argue that, well, they'll never pass that law and I'll say, great, so we never left the honeymoon phase. Fine. <laughs> but that's not what Bitcoin is designed to do, It's kind of stay in this phase where nobody ever cares um, because it's not having enough impact. Or... It sits in this phase because it's a politically secured money, right? The vote is what secures the money, which is also the status quo, which obviously hasn't worked. So security rests entirely on them resisting through covert operation. This is a very important principle when it comes to the technology. If you're resisting the state and you're not hiding, what are you? You're lucky or you're in jail, right? Um, you know, or you can break out the pitchforks and fight out in the open. But basically, Bitcoin assumes that people will... will will violate the prohibition and do it covertly. Well, how do they do it covertly? What if it, you know, what if it requires massive machinery and all this stuff, right? This is where we start talking about decentralization. This is why decentralization matters, because you can't hide if you're running a major operation, right? So hiding is necessary to the security model. Anonymity is necessary to the security model. The ability to get the data without having to provide identity or get permission, right? Try to get access to all the accounting information in the Federal Reserve. Try to submit a transaction through the Federal Reserve System, right? Without permission, you can't do it. So Bitcoin doesn't require any permission, and it, allow, and, it, and it requires that people be able to operate at small scale for the sole purpose of being able to operate covertly. Okay, so I covered those, miners and merchants. So every, every individual person in these two categories of the market are defining their own level of acceptable risk. Okay, so you know, if, if people don't want to take any risk, there's just not going to be many people using the money. Um, but this is not something that the software can determine, right? And it's not something you can predict based on some kind of economic foresight. It's just people's willingness to resist. It's like all prices. 
you, they're in people's minds, their preferences. Okay, so in doing this, each secures their own piece of the market against the state's attack. And if a cryptocurrency does not allow risk sharing, it cannot be secure. In other words, if one entity is ultimately taking all the risk and it gets two life sentences, you know, it's not a secure system. So that's principle number one. Bitcoin operates, all the other, each principle builds on the other. Nothing can happen unless people can hide, operate in secret, and therefore share all the risk of running the system. Okay, energy sinking. This is more cool. Um, so I'll just start to read, I guess I'll read these. A person must be given authority to order transactions. I see one of those transaction ordering guys in the back of the room there. Um, all right, so, so how does that happen in Bitcoin? How does some person get the authority to choose the transactions? They get lucky, right? <laughs> they run a bunch of stuff and they get lucky. Oh, I, I get to do it today, right? So it's, it's anonymous, it's probabilistic, but it is a person being given authority temporarily to order the transactions. And due to risk sharing, this requires anonymous proof of authority. How do you get anonymous proof of authority? Well, Satoshi said, we'll use proof of work. That sounds like a great idea. The great thing about proof of work is it's basically anonymous. Anybody can presumably come up with energy and you don't need permission to, you know, or, or any identity to get the data that you need to mine. Okay, so these anonymous systems could be either internal or external. This is my terminology. So internal to the coin means all the, all the information about who's the authority is derivable from what's in the, in the chain, essentially, right? External means it's completely independent of the chain who gets authority. It's just being injected into the, into the money. So proof of work is obviously that external source of energy coming in. Proof of stake is the internal source of information that's already there. And there really are no, somebody tell me if you, know, you can think of something else, but I don't see any other ways to do it. There's, there's an internal system and there's an external system. You can call them what you want, but it's really staking and energy. Because everything external is gonna reduce to energy. Um, one of my favorite you know, examples, and again, this is why developers need to know these principles. Because you could go off and develop something like Chia, and think you're making a difference where well, you're really not. Because the same amount of energy is going to be consumed to produce the same amount of security. You're just going to be doing it by manufacturing crap loads of hard drives. Um, so, and moving them around and plugging them in, doing all those things, those things caught, ultimately reduce to energy. And the same amount has to be consumed to provide the same level of security. So, um, I won't, you know, that's a fun topic. I won't go into more detail on that. But um, two ways to do it. Well, what's, what's, why, don't, why doesn't the stake work? People come, come up with all kinds of reasons why state doesn't work. Uh, my, my reason is a little different. Uh, a sensor with controlling state cannot be unseated. There's no way to get them out. Once they have controlling state, they own the money. It's over. Right? You can go create a new money, right? start over, keep shrinking your monies. But um, that's why it's not crypto dynamically secure. A sensor with majority work can be unseated. Just add more work. You can always add more work to the system. And then what I described earlier about the free market paying higher fees to get their transactions confirmed by the free market miners is, is the injection of more energy. When you pay more, you get more energy. The system absorbs that energy and creates another, um, what do you call it, authority, right? Another, another person to order the transactions. So if a cryptocurrency does not order by sinking energy, it can't be secure. Principle number two. Of course, it has to be, you know, risk sharing still applies. That, that, that hasn't changed. So last, third principle. These are like Newton's laws of, of Bitcoin, in my mind. I hope Bitcoin becomes that important. Um, power regulating principle. I've already described this, so just kind of summarize this. Uh, a sustained 51% attack can censor all transactions. It's totally doable. As a sensor ignores unauthorized transactions, their fees rise. Rising fees compensate other miners, increasing overall hash rate. To maintain majority hash rate, the sensor must subsidize through taxation. Um, this results in competition between taxation and the fee premium, the offsetting fees, not the total fees, because remember, if everybody's taking the same transactions, the sensor is making the same amount of money as the market, right? So, how can the market get the get? How can the market get their the, the black market transactions mined? They have to pay extra, and the extra is what makes the difference. So this is a good example of uh, another error that developers have made, um, thinking that an inflation-only coin can be secure. It's not just a simple kind of arbitrary choice, maybe a little more inflation, a little more fees. 
Inflation does nothing to secure, and by inflation I mean the other block subsidy, right? It, it does nothing to secure against censorship. Absolutely zero. And if you had a whole coin based on inflation, like perpetual inflation and no fees, it would be absolutely insecure. And that's what this principle says. If it does not regulate power with fees, it cannot be secure. Um, so why is that? Again, if you only had inflation, you have no way to identify and pay more for the transactions that are getting rejected. So every miner is taking the same transactions, presumably only the legal ones, because there's no more money in taking the illegal ones. Right? So the black market miner and the white market miner are the same miner. They're, they're making the same money, and there's no way to create a difference between them to overpower the sensor. That's why inflation does not work. OK, my last slide, just some insights. Um, crypto dynamic security defines Bitcoin in my terminology. Right? That, that's what I mean by crypto. Now. It's what defines it, the concept of Bitcoin. If you take those three principles and you apply them with good engineering, you essentially have Bitcoin, right? You might get the blocks too big, and you might not be able to be, you know, be, op be able to operate covertly. You might get the interval too frequent, and you know, there's all kinds of things you can get wrong. But if you don't, if you don't do these things, it's not Bitcoin. If you do do them, it may or may not be a good Bitcoin. Utility, which means the usefulness of the money, is not assured. It's not guaranteed because of some crypto we wrote, right? It, it, it's the utility is that the benefit of the money must exceed the cost of using it. So if the fees rise high enough because the sensor is willing to tax enough, the money won't be useful. People will just stop using it because it's not better than the, than the state money. So when we talk about engineering, what, is, what does that mean? Like we're trying to make Bitcoin better. You know, there's a whole room full of people here and recognize a bunch of people that, you know, they're out there trying to make Bitcoin better. And in many ways, all the things they're doing are making Bitcoin better by these principles, and sometimes they're not. So if you can make it more private, um, be able to operate more efficiently at small scale, what does that mean? Now there's less risk in doing it and less cost in doing it, which means that the black market can be more effective against that one big centralized player, right? Which means the fee premium is lower. Therefore, it's a better money than it would have been otherwise. So these things that improve privacy, re re um, reduce scale of necessary operation, contribute to the security of Bitcoin. So when we talk about you know, some of the things we're doing with um, also you know, decoupling inputs and outputs, that's also allowing people to operate um, privately, more privately. So people secure Bitcoin by assuming personal risk. Right? None of the things we described can be done if somebody's not taking any, any personal risk. So, again, it's kind of, I already said it, but core development is, when we talk about core development, from my perspective, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about improving Bitcoin so that the fee premium will be lower, so that people, and, you know, and merchanting will be less costly, so that people will actually do it um, when it's not okay to do it. If it's okay to do it, it stays in the honeymoon phase, so what? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay, that's all I got. Yes. Hi, I come from uh, from Spain, and uh, at least in Spain, we're getting a lot of uh, fellow nerds that are leaving from Venezuela. And in Venezuela, the government is going, if not against uh, Bitcoin, at least against miners, the mm -hmm. local ones. Do you think that governments like uh, those in Venezuela can be used as kind of a lab test to understand the, the sure, action, or they they lack enough power to be relevant? So this, I'm gonna. I'm going to take your question and move it into a bigger context because there's some more questions that'll come out of that. But it's it's all it's all kind of connected. So when when I give this talk, people will inevitably in the back of their minds are thinking, well, some states will ban it, some states won't, right? And we're kind of in that situation. I said nobody's doing it, but you know, um, there are there are corners of the world like Venezuela that are making an effort, right? But it doesn't really matter where the bound where the borders are. Right. What you, what you have to think of is there's a group of people that are operating as white market and there's a group of people that are operating as black market. That always, that's always the case. It's going to be the case. Right. So, so if you know, only Venezuela you know, creates a black market, right, and white market's huge, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter to Bitcoin. It might matter in Venezuela. But we're talking about system level security. How does this money actually stay functional? So imagine we get to you know, a, a, 
like a drug, drug war scale banning of Bitcoin. Like, you know, this is all money laundering. We got Fed coin, it's perfectly safe. You should do that. But if you do this, you're money laundering. You know, to me, that's such, if Bitcoin is effective, that's inevitable, right? So, so when that happens, people say, well, you know, maybe, maybe Moscow will say it's all cool or Iran or something, right? Yeah, but they're already money launders, right? I mean, by the definitions we, we deal with today in the financial system, they're already cut out of the finance. It's no different, right? So yes, that will happen. But all it means is that they're just a big piece of land with a lot of black market in it. If they're in the, if they can't muster enough hash rate, then you know it doesn't make any difference. So it, it's always the, the black market will succeed to the extent it wants to and takes the risk. But Bitcoin is unique. It's not like it's like gold analogy is like very good in some ways and just horrible in other ways. How do you attack gold from a single point on the planet? <laughs> you can put up one mine and attack Bitcoin all around the planet. That's, that's a weakness, and people have to recognize that. So it doesn't really matter where the white and the black market is. It just matters that there's enough state, right, enough taxpayer money to muster, uh, to, to raise the, the fee level to the point where people won't use the money anymore. So I hope that actually answered your question. Um, okay, so I'll just restate because it wasn't the mic. Um, what do I think about holding multiple currencies as a defense against you know, state level attacks on, say, one or the biggest one? Right? Um, well, if the currencies are very similar, there's, and, and, they're, and they are independent of the state, you know, they are bitcoins, which means they could be secure, then Thier's law applies, which means that. It's more costly to use the crappier ones, so everybody ends up using the better one. It's the inverse of Gresham's law, right? And it's more costly because you have a higher exchange costs, because you know not everybody's taking the smaller one. That's why it's smaller. The more people that take a money, the more valuable the money is, the more useful it is. So it's like having you know European money versus the euro, right? I remember going country to country in Europe and changing my money everywhere. It gets really expensive. So that's kind of what you're talking about. Okay, well, well, we can use all these different monies to try to have a better money, but in the end, all you're doing is raising the cost of the money. So it, it's still kind of the same problem. Deere's law says it'll all collapse into one. If that one gets attacked and goes away, well, you can just create it again, right? You can do it again, but, but the, the smaller monies will be weaker, and they'll be more costly to use. So it's not really solving the problem. Uh, personally, I don't, you know, I think experimenting with different approaches is great. You come, somebody can, you know, find, if, if somebody can be the Einstein to my Newton here and find a, you know, a new concept, that would be awesome. It really would. But has anybody seen a new concept, I mean, a truly new concept that, that actually works after hearing how I describe these concepts? Yeah. I haven't. Right. Right. So to, to restate, you, 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 just, you like the, the, the power balancing principle, which is that there's a balance between not the fees, but the fee premium and the tax, right? And yeah, the market can just push the state out if it wants to, because miners will be incented and they'll mine. Or they won't, and the fees will go up. <laughs> to, it's up to the point where they're infinite and you can't get anything through, right? That nobody mines anymore. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get that. The, the way you're spreading, spreading the risk as a cost. Right. Maybe there's a point in which that cost is just the same cost uh, from, from very different things. And you said, okay, it's the minimum cost. Right. right. It, it, it turns out to be the, the same thing, right? You've got you to transact across a bunch of currencies with exchange costs, and, or you have one currency and you know you have all the costs bundled up in there. But yeah, it, it all comes down to cost. I mean, it's, it's, it's like um, I was having a discussion with somebody just yesterday, and he's like, okay, is it hash power that secures the history or against censorship? I'm like, well, hash power doesn't secure against anything. It's money. <laughs> it's, it's, again, principles of action. Somebody has to spend some money for Bitcoin to be secure. They have to pay a miner to go do the mining. That's a payment, and whether it comes through inflation or not, it's still, it's somebody, somebody actually has to make, pay it. And remember, inflation doesn't actually guard against um, censorship. 
right? In inflation is designed to distribute the coins and it does pay miners, but it doesn't pay miners in a way that guards against censorship because the censor gets paid the exact same amount as the non-censor. There's no differential. You can't, you know, this differential can't be created and you can't push the, you can't push the state out. So, I don't know, I've lost my turn of thought, but <laughs> if anybody can remind me, I'll, I'll go back. Sure. Uh, in your slide, this was uh, anonymous proof can be as an internal stake or external work. Uh, as I understand, you mean proof of stake and proof of work, right? Right, when I turned to refer to... Is there any difference with internal or external in your opinion? The, the difference between internal and external proof is that internal proof cannot be secure and external proof can be, right? They be and the reason for that is because internal proof, um, nothing new can be brought into the system. So once the sensor has enough of whatever it takes, whether it's 50% of some stake or any other complicated formula, once they've achieved enough, there's not going to be any way to get them out. And of course, if the system's anonymous and you know decentralized, small operation like it has to be to be secure because that's the first principle, then there's no way to know whether the state's doing it, right? They're just as anonymous as everybody else. So you can't identify them and kind of kick them out. You could reset your coin and you know throw a bunch of coins out and try to start over, but every time you do that, your, your coin just gets less valuable, it gets smaller. That's that's what's wrong with the I call it the proof of work fallacy, the idea that you could just you know hard fork your way out of 51% attacks. Every time you do that. Who gets screwed? Who's, who's the miner going out of business? It's the big miner or the small miners? Who's got better margins? There's a premium for being big, right? So you make more money, you have more capital, you, 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 can, you, can, you can build more stuff you know, afterwards. And I've actually put this to big miners, it says, yeah, we just, we just retool, right? Small miners are like, they're, they're completely out of business. So, so you, just, you, know, you, just, you do that, which is not great, but you just, you just, keep, make, you just keep shrinking your money, right? And this, I, I wrote that up, there's a number of, um, I'm getting the hook here, I think. And there's a number of uh, explanations for, for why that is. Anton? All right. 